Sisters and brothers, you know, no. holiness simply holiness is to become Christ-like. To be Jesus in in flesh and blood has demonstrated to you and me in flesh and blood the life of a child of God. You follow what I'm saying? Holiness is the life of Jesus. So when Saint Peter says, "Be holy," when God says to you and me, "Be holy," as as I am holy, in other words, he's saying, "Be Christ-like." You've got a model before you. And when you compare yourself to that model, Jesus Christ, I'll show you areas in your life that need to change, that need to be healed, that you need to be freed from, that you need to convert to. This is spirituality. And most of us who come to divine don't understand this. And that is why we, we, we go back from here for a little time, we live a new life and then slowly, because you're not being taught, you're not being encouraged, you're not being enlightened, you can't help going back to that old life. And what do you go back to? Anxiety. You go back to sadness. You go back to broken relationships. You go back to pride. You go back to jealousy. You go back to gossip. You go back to slander. All that rubbish slowly comes back into our and they are miserable Christians. Okay, you follow what I'm saying? So that's so that's the goal. Be holy. God is saying, be holy, for I am holy. He says. What does Saint Paul say in Ephesians chapter one? Says, referring to us. I'll read from verse three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, sisters and brothers. God has, through our baptism, God has blessed you and me with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Everything that you and I need to live a godly life, to live the life of a saint, to, to imitate Jesus, they have been blessed with. The grace has come. The, the, the ability has come. So God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. And what are all these spiritual blessings for? Why has God blessed me with every spiritual blessing? That even before the foundations of the world, he has chosen me in Jesus that I may be blameless and holy before him. For all these blessings God has poured into my life. Why? To make me blameless in our words, in, in a sense to live a very holy life. That's why for us Catholics, you know, we are so blessed here. Dear sisters, go back to your foundress and look at the life she lived. And you are her daughter. And she is your model. So the Holy Spirit will say to you, imitate her, imitate her, imitate her. For us lay people, Jesus is our model. We have to read the lives of the saints and see how they prayed, what suffering they went to, how they forgave, how they loved, how they prayed, how they went to Jesus, how the, the blessed sacrament, the sacraments, all that. And so as I read their lives, I'm enlightened to, to say, come on, follow them, follow them. You know, St. Pope John Paul II, in his pontificate of over 25 years, I don't think any Pope canonized and beatified so many men and women in, 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 in his pontificate. All the time he was beatifying, calling people blessed. He was making saints, you know, uh, canonizing men. What do you think? He had nothing else to do. So he said, let me just fill up my time. And so let me now fill up this Saturday and I'll canonize this guy. And I'll beatify this woman and this. No. He was shouting from the rooftops. He's saying to you and me, listen, no excuses. These men I'm canonizing. These men and women that I'm beatifying, they are human beings just like you. See how they responded to God. See how they surrendered to Jesus. See how they lived their lives. Imitate them, imitate them, imitate them. In the old days, we Catholics, you know, our dear mothers and fathers would, would bring the lives of the saints to our home. Yes or no? We grew up. But today, <laughs> what books are your children reading? Are you even concerned about putting a book of the saint in their hands? 
They are reading all worldly stuff. So you read worldly stuff, they turn into worldly people. You read godly stuff, you turn, turn into a godly person. As parents, we have this awesome responsibility. You know, we affect generations. And so I should see, so as a disciple of Jesus, after all Jesus is saying, come follow me. Okay, let me come to this point now. You see, I'll give you this beautiful example. Now St. Paul, for me after Mother Mary, is one of the greatest Christians that ever lived. Okay? Three quarters of the New Testament he has written. A man with abundant revelations. Just amazing. Each of those letters, Romans and Galatians and Ephesians and Thessalonians and Timothy and Titus and, and all those epistles. Just amazing, deep revelation of what the kingdom is all about, what Christianity is all about. And St. Paul will say, when he talks of himself, in, in, in Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3, I'll read from, okay, in verse 6 he says, in Philippians chapter 3 verse 6 he says, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, and as to righteousness under the law, blameless, he says. He says, I was so zealous for the Jewish faith, he says. My heart burned to preserve the Jewish faith. And now this, this Jesus Christ has come. A false prophet has come. And he's, he's you know what I'm saying, he's, he's uh, pushing aside the law of Moses and he's furious and he's persecuting the Christians. And he says, regarding the law, I was blameless. In other words, I kept the law of God as closely as possible. So he was a very holy and righteous Jew. He thought he was holy and he thought he was very holy. And he was very righteous. He said, regarding the law, I was blameless. In other words, he was a very good law-abiding Jew. But now he encounters Jesus on the road to Damascus. And the Lord says to him, come on Peter, follow me, he says. So Peter's enthused, Paul is enthusiastic and he says, okay, I'm following you, Jesus. But immediately when he starts following Jesus, Peter realizes there's something within him that is preventing him and keeping him back from following Jesus. He can't follow Jesus. You must read this in Romans chapter 7 and Romans chapter 8. Read the whole chapter. Read Romans chapter 7 from verse 14 onwards. Let me read this to you. Romans, I'll just tell you. Romans chapter 7 verse 14 to Romans chapter 8 verse 8. You must read all those verses. You must study the faith, sisters and brothers. You know. We Catholics are terrible. We just don't know our Bible. We don't know our doctrine. And why is it we are not studying? Why is it we are not enthusiastic? Because for me the main reason is I am not following Jesus. I have not surrendered my life. Number two, okay, I'll give you some money, I'll give you some church, but leave me to myself. It's my life. I decide how to live my life. So when I go that way, then this thirst for God, longing for God, growing in the love and understanding of the ways of God will not be there in my life. I'm just thinking, okay, if I go for Mass and say my rosary and read my Bible and go for a prayer meeting and come once a year to Porta, it's fine. You'll be, you'll be the same miserable person. You can come here year after year, but there will be no let up in the anxieties, in the fears, in the tensions, in the broken relationships, in the emptiness, the sadness. Oof, life is... How people live without Jesus, I don't know. I need Him 24-7. My whole day goes with Him. Now St. Paul will say in Romans 7 verse 14, Okay, he says the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. He says, I'm carnal. He says, the law is spiritual. In other words, the law of God, the commandments of God, can only be kept in the spirit through the help of the Holy Spirit. But he says, I am carnal, sold under sin. In other words, he says, it's impossible for me, a carnal person, a sinful person, to bring forth anything spiritual. I cannot. And this you must experience, this you must realize in your own life. Like St. Paul. 
So St. Paul will continue to say, I can only, listen to St. Paul, St. Paul says, St. Paul says, I can only will what is good, but I cannot do it. Have you come to that experience? You know you have to forgive, but I can't forgive. You know you have to be detached from this thing or that thing or this one or that one. I cannot. You know I have to pray. How much you are told about pray, pray, pray? Do you pray? What's your personal prayer? You know you have to read your Bible and just when it comes to reading the Bible, someone will phone or you'll say, oh I'll do this, I'll do that, do this, do this. And then you put off, put off, put off. And the Bible, when the day goes without reading the Bible. I'm saying this in love. You may discipline yourself to go for mass and you think that's, that's the end of everything. That's the all in all. Sorry. Don't misunderstand me. I go for daily mass. But when Jesus comes into, comes into my life through the Eucharist, he's saying, Fritz, come follow me. Trust in me. I'm your Savior. I'm your Lord. You, I'm the Good Shepherd. You need me 24-7. So the Eucharist energizes me and motivates me to, to live in deeper union with Jesus. Not that I say I have the, I've gone for mass and everything's fine. So then Paul continues to say, he says, you know, I I, I realize it's a law that whenever I want to do good, evil lies close at hand, he says. There's something that prevents me from doing the good that I know I should do. And now he despairs of following Jesus. He despairs. And I believe me, sisters, now this is my understanding. Until you despair of following Jesus, and you can truly say of yourself, like what St. Paul said of himself, wretched man that I am, wretched woman that I am, who will save me from this body of death? You haven't understood what it means to be a Christian. Haven't understood. You're just trying to be devotional. And with all those devotions that we are following, we are still this, practically the same anxious, sad, lonely, who knows what, worldly, you know, discontent, insecure, no real peace in the heart. There can't be any peace. Because the soul has to rise to God. And all these things that I'm attached to, and, I'm, and that I'm putting my trust in, is pulling the soul down. So your soul cannot be at peace. So Paul despairs. And he says, in in Romans 7 verse 24, he says, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And immediately the Holy Spirit gives him the answer and he says, Thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I love this scripture. This is nearly every day. when 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 I look at certain areas in my life, okay, when I look at certain areas in my life, I... I, I know that I know that I know that in myself I, I cannot come out of them. There's no way I can come out of them. These sinful tendencies, these sinful areas have enslaved me and there's no hope for me in myself. And so, but, but instead of despairing and giving up hope, I get the answer from the Holy Spirit as St. Paul says, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Immediately he says, thanks be to God through our Lord, Jesus Christ. So Jesus will deliver me. Jesus will free me. Jesus will enable me to do what he's asked me to do. You know what? Jesus wants you to be a happy child. Jesus wants to be a free child. Jesus wants you to be fulfilled. Like any natural father, we are uh, all parents here, grandparents, we'll do everything within our means to make our children happy, yes or no. And yet we are so selfish. Up to a point we'll do, then beyond that we'll say, go. I'm sorry. But not God my father. His love is infinite. He loves me not what he can get from me. He loves me for my sake. That's why this love of God is a mystery. Jesus, how do you love me? You still love me. I see all these areas in my life that are not pleasing to you. And you still love me. You never give up on me. That's why you can't find anyone like Jesus. You can't find anyone like the Father. That's why Jesus must be your first love. First love. 
And if he's not your first love, sorry. All these other loves will simply destroy you. In that first love of Jesus, then I can be a good husband to my wife. And when I'm a good husband to my wife, my wife will respond to me favorably. And our life as a couple is, is so life-giving. We appreciate each other, we love each other, we respect each other, we help each other. I'm just saying, for me, there's nothing that I won't do. I just go to the sink, I'll wash her. I see my wife working, I'll say, sweetheart, just get up now, let me go, let me wash up. I'll wash up for you. In whatever way I can help, I will... Same thing with my children. You know. I'll be so, be so understanding towards them, give them their space. But lovingly point, to, point out to them, this is the way of God. Come, come, follow this way. Don't go that way. Follow this way, follow this way. You know? Because Jesus is my first love. Even as parents, our love, if up to a certain point, you can love your children. But when your children you know, don't give you the, that, that response and that respect and obedience, your love immediately will dry up and you say, go, do what you want. I don't care. Immediately the Lord will convict me and say, that is sin. I love you unconditionally with all your faults, with all your failures. I never give up on you. How dare you have that attitude towards your child. And then I have to repent. You see, I see the need for conversion. I see the need for change. And you say, Lord, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. I'm sorry, sorry. And then I will be reconciled with my child. And I'll talk nicely to my child. And I'll say sorry to my child. Lord. I say, darling, sorry if I upset you. Forgive me. And our relationship is restored. You know? So first and foremost, for you to see the need for change, for ongoing repentance, first and foremost, if, this is my understanding, if our lives are not surrendered to Jesus, you will never come to a realization of this horror within you, this terrible disease of sin. And you know, sisters and brothers, this disease of sin is so deadly that it has taken the life of God to save you and me from it. Such a deadly disease. No medication, no counseling, no therapy can deal with your sin other than the life of God. And that is why you'll find in, in Matthew 1, 21, when Joseph comes to know that Mary is pregnant and he being a just man, he wants to put her away quietly, he goes to sleep and that night in a dream, the angel of the Lord comes to him and says, Joseph, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because the child she has conceived is through the Holy Spirit. Now listen carefully. And you will call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. So what is the vocation of Jesus? What is the mission of Jesus? Primarily to save you and me from our sinful areas. So I ask you this afternoon. You've come here for, a, for, this, for this growth program. Have you... Let, let me give you a simple example. I'm a dentist by profession. Okay? You come to me with a broken knee. Will I treat you? Hello, yes or no? No, it's a sorry. That's not my... You come to me with a stomach problem, will I treat you? No. You come to me with migraine headache, will I treat you? No. Only if I come to you with, with a tooth problem, I say, yes, I'm a doctor for teeth, I will treat you, yes or no? Now there's no time for me to go into it. I can give you any number of scriptures. Jesus is the sin specialist. The sin specialist. Matthew 1, 21, you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. On, 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 that, on, on that first Christmas night, in, in Luke chapter 2, 9 and 10, and I bring you good news of great joy, for to you is born in the city of David, a Savior, Christ the Lord. Jesus comes to save. John 1, 29, um, John the Baptist looks at Jesus and says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Romans 6, 6, we know that our old self has been crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that we might no longer be enslaved to sin. 
Jesus died to free me from the enslavement, the deception, the bondage of sin within me and you, in the whole universe. I can give you many more scriptures. So he is a sin specialist. Now in my understanding, what are we going to Jesus for? Tell me. What are you going to Jesus for? Blessings. Okay, that's secondary. Okay. Pardon? Ah, if that's the case, fine. Then you're going to Jesus for the right purpose. But most of us go to him for everything. God, do this for me. Do that for me. But we are not going to him for redemption from sin. So you, for me, you missed the whole act of redemption. Sin is your problem. Sin is my problem. And so if I don't go to Jesus to come out of sin, if I'm not conscious of my sinful areas, then what is this Jesus all about? Then you're left in your sin, and your sin will destroy you. Ah, you shake your head. <laughs> we don't understand this. And so that ongoing change that God wants to work on, that ongoing repentance that I... That I should be aware of, should I be looking to God for, is not happening in my life. I'm stuck where I am, stuck where I am, as all those old problems are there, eating into my life. And when I'm burdened, when I'm troubled, when I'm sad, that is why you know something, sisters and brothers, that is why I'll tell you something. You don't talk of Jesus to others. I'll give you a simple example. I'm a cancer specialist, okay? And, any, and you've had cancer, you've come to me, and someone has told you, go to Brother Fritz, he's a cancer specialist, and all his, you know, his treatment is 100% successful. So you come to me with cancer, and I cure you, yes or no? Now tomorrow you know someone has got cancer. Will you keep quiet? What's the natural thing for you to do? Say, go to Brother Fritz. He's a splendid doctor. Jesus is the doctor of doctors for every illness. So unless I have experienced the reality of Jesus working in my life in turbulent situations, difficult situations, financial situations, you name it, hurtful situations, I have had to turn to Jesus and Jesus has given me the therapy, given me the remedy, I have applied it and I have come out gloriously out of it. Unless it is a reality on me, to me, why will I tell others about Jesus? You don't evangelize, you don't talk about the Lord, you don't, you're not interested in bringing others to the, to the Lord. For me, all these are indications that Jesus is not Jesus to me and to you. You look in the Gospels. Soon as someone encountered Jesus, that woman at the well living in sin, she had five men, she encounters Jesus at the well, she realizes he's the Messiah, she's flooded with joy, she leaves her pot, runs to the village, and the whole village comes to Jesus. Andrew meets Jesus, he recognizes the Messiah, he runs and calls his brother Peter, say, come, 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 we've met them. That shouldn't be, sisters and mother. He's good news. So the good news becomes a reality when you see this ongoing repentance. So for me, every, believe or no exaggeration, every day I only come to Jesus for one thing. Very rarely do I, have, do I pray for anything temporal, financial, nothing. I, I rarely mention them. I come to Jesus only for holiness, only for purity. In my mind, in my thoughts, in my lifestyle, I know where there is sin, what I'm attached to, what I need to be detached from. I come to Jesus. And you know, it's just amazing. Forty years ago, forty years ago, I threw my job away. Forty years ago. And I left my job with a saving of 25,000 rupees. That was my saving. And when I look at my life these forty years, I just can... Recall miracle, 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 miracle. And not only in my life, I've got a community. I've got married people. One brother has four children, another one has got five children, another one has got two children, and some single sisters. In a sense, I'm like their father. So it's my responsibility in a way to even care for them. But do I think about it? Do I worry about it? No. All I think about is. 
takes in all my life. That's all I pray to him for. And unknowingly I realize, you know what I'm living? Matthew 6, 33, where Jesus says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. First the kingdom of God, the reign of God, the lordship of Jesus, the will of the Father, the leading of the Holy Spirit. You are a child of God. Your life no longer belongs to you. It belongs to God. He is my Father. He knows what. Which, which child worries about its school fees? Which child worries about its, where is the bath water coming? Which child worries about uniform? Which child worries about food? Which child worries about school books? Nothing. And as a child, you have to go to the, 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 to the father and give me, give me, give me school books. I need money for tuition fee. I need money for school fees. I need money for chocolate. Oh, no. Daddy provides. Yes or no? God is daddy. God is daddy. And we are not trusting in God. And that's why our lives are such a mess. We are living in separation. Sin has separated me from my God. So when you understand this simple principle that this is where I think most of us haven't understood. When you come to Jesus, what does it mean to come to Jesus? He says, come, follow me. No more right all my life. My life belongs to him. From now onwards, it is his voice that I need to listen to. His voice that I have to follow. And it's a process. It's nothing instant. It's a lifelong process. Till my dying day, I, if, if, if I allow Jesus to be the Lord of my life, He'll be continually showing me the need for conversion, for change, for change, for change, for ongoing repentance, as long as by the grace of God I surrender to His Lordship, I've yielded my life to my Heavenly Father and I say to my Father, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done. And I surrender my life to the Holy Spirit and I long to be led by the Spirit and I long to be controlled by the Spirit. I see the need for ongoing change.